Um, good evening, and it's a great honor to be able to speak about this particular book. Um, I had the pleasure of reading this in manuscript form for the publishers. I was asked for my opinion about the book, and I was able to say, without any hesitation, unreservedly, that it should be published and published as soon as possible. Um, Jane wields her pen like a surgeon using a knife with great precision, uh, whereas a surgeon might be removing a cancer from somebody's body, she uses her pen to remove a political cancer from the body politic, and she does so uh, by peeling apart things are not seen, revealing them to us, in order that we can understand better what the problem is and how we can deal with it. Um, she's already indicated some of the relevance of this book, but let me give a few examples as well. The first, to try to bring it right back to us here in the University of Johannesburg, is a personal example. Uh, last February, um, the research which I was conducting with, in fact, Trevor and Guani and with somebody else, Karen Runciman, was delayed because somebody within the, in the security network decided to undertake a number of different things. They stole a couple of computers within a few days. Uh, they, um, uh, they tried to break into our offices, though without uh, stealing anything. They cut uh, electric fences which were there to protect us. Um, and eventually they stole some of our data, uh, which was in a Dropbox account. It was clear to everybody that was involved, everybody who knows about these things, that this was the work of the security forces in one way or another. Uh, some people said it wasn't the intelligence people because they can get the information they want anyway. They drop a robot onto your computer and it sends back the information they want. And therefore it was likely to be the police. But then when I spoke to somebody who'd been very senior in the security services, he said, no, no, that's security. That's the way they operate. This is about intimidation. This is what happens in our own university. So the book has to be taken seriously by everybody here because it affects us directly. It's not just something out there, something abstract. This is what's happening in terms of the kind of work that we're doing. The second example comes from yesterday, from the budget speech. I don't know if you, any of you read the budget speech in detail, but there we find that the government spending on public order and safety and on defence will continue to increase. Increase from 163 billion rand a year to 193 billion rand a year. Now, nearly all, most of this uh, money goes on the police. Now, do the maths. That's a 22% increase going into the security services. Other areas of expenditure, if they're lucky, get more or less an inflation increase. We as taxpayers have to pay more tax. There's a cost that has to be borne for mistakes made by the government in the past. But the one area of spending which goes up is on the police. And then it's interesting to see what the justification for this is. So let me go back to the minister's speech. Honourable members, he says, honourable, honourable members, we will confront unacceptably high levels of crime in our country. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? None of us like crime. We must confront them, deal with this problem. Next sentence. Government spending on public order and safety, etc., etc. Now, public order is about dealing with processions, gatherings, most of which are legal. So the, here there's this elision between crime on the one hand and people's legal activities on the other hand. The police are there to prevent us from engaging in legal activities. That's by very, very clearly the implication here. Now, those of us who follow those things will be aware that this comes at the end of very strong lobbying from the Minister of Police and the Commissioner of the South African uh, Police. Now, part of their argument is that there's been this exponential rise in the number of protests, many of which are violent. Now, it turns out that the police don't keep statistics for protests. What they do is, is, is keep statistics for what they call incidents. Some of those incidents they regard as peaceful, some of them are unrest related. But these are not, these are not statistics for protests at all, even though that's the way in which they get represented by the police, and I'm afraid often in the media as well. So here we have this, this discourse being developed 
that violence about protests. And then it leads to this justification for increased expenditure on the security forces. This is a, an example of the process of securitization um, which Jane is dealing with. And it's worth then coupling this with what else is happening in the budget. The, roughly speaking, this increase in security uh, spending, uh, 30 billion, 30 billion round, 30 billion round, 30 and nine noughts. Now, what does that mean in real terms? Let's say an RDP house costs 100,000 rand. They don't, they cost less than that. But just to do the sums and keep it simple, 360,000 houses could have been built with that increase in expenditure upon the police. And those of us who are studying protests know that one of the key issues now facing people is that they don't have houses. They're fed up with living in backyard shacks, in backyard rooms, and they want to uh, have some kind of room of their own and as a consequence of that are often occupying pieces of land. Now rather than the government putting up houses to help them or even simply putting in a tap on a piece of land that people have occupied because they've got nowhere else to live, instead of doing that they repress people who are engaged in those kinds of activities. So here we have a state that is uncaring, unsympathetic to the problems of ordinary people and instead repressing them when they engage in protests in order to just to defend their basic livelihoods. Now, I want to pose a few questions and I want to pose the first one by reference uh, to a memorandum that some of us got, senior people in the university here. And it comes from uh, the chief of staff of the Department of Higher Education and training. Blade and Zamandi, Comrade Blade. Uh, many of us have known him over many years. Now what does this Chief of Staff have to tell us? He says, circular, abiding by proper procedure and protocol in communication sent to the Minister of Higher Education and Training. It has come to our attention that a number of deans, head of school, and college professors, he didn't mention librarians, but he might just as well have mentioned librarians, are writing letters, writing letters to the minister. Proper procedure and protocol, however, dictates that communicate to the minister be authored by the vice chancellor or the chairperson of the university council. There you are. You may be a chief librarian, you may be a senior professor, but you can't write to the minister. I mean, you know, it's one thing to, for him to say, look, I haven't got time, can't write, you know, respond to all of these letters. But now we're told we can't even write to the minister. And we're the professors. Think what it's like if you're a student. You, you certainly can't write to the minister. Think what it's like if you're an ordinary person involved in some occupation of land because you haven't got a house can't write to a minister about that, has to go through the proper channels. So my first question to Jane then is, to what extent is this separation of the police from society, this increasing unaccountability of the police, associated with a wider shift within the state, separation of the state from civil society, which certainly, from the research that we're doing, is one of the key factors behind many of the protests that we see uh, around um, the country. So that's my, that's my first question. My second question then, and, and I'm glad that, um, that Jane was indicating that um, she doesn't think there's going to be uh, full-blown repression, because I think one of the dangers for us when we talk about uh, sec securitization um, is it can lead to a certain fear that we better not raise our ha heads because we're only going to get them cut off by these powerful uh, security uh, forces. Um, and she says we're not going to have uh, full-blown um, re repression. Uh, I, I, I would, I would, it would be helpful to me to know precisely what is meant by full-blown repression. Does it mean the apartheid regime? Does it mean a state working together with perhaps uh, uh, very violent forces in Rwanda or somewhere else to kill millions of people. What, what, is, what is it really about? And, and what are the factors conditioning the extent to which there is repression? Why is there more repression now? It would seem that there was before. And, might, and why might there be more or less repression in the future? Now, Jane has given part of the answer, I think, but I think there are other issues which um, perhaps we should consider in the discussion. The first is, what's the role of capitalism, particularly big capital, in all of this? 
Um, now, when one works through some of the records of the Maracana Commission of Inquiry, there was one which stands out for me. And this is the minutes of a meeting uh, between um, one of the Lonmin vice presidents and the commissioner of police in North uh, West. Somebody called him Bombo. And it's fascinating because here you have the detail of their discussion. Here you have them working out together how they're going to deal with the problem of workers at Maracana. Here you have them plotting. Here you have them plotting what became a massacre at Maracana. And we have the minutes of it. We know it happened. Long men, in their usual bureaucratic way, kept a recording. They put it down on paper, and it's come through to us in the public. Now, what happens there? And Bombo says that uh, an important person has been on the phone, has been on the phone saying we must take action here at Maracana. And the, the chap from uh, Long Min says, who is it? Is it Cyril? And she says, yes, it's Cyril, Cyril Ramaphosa. And it's very clear in the case of Maracana that Lomin is putting pressure, first of all on the Minister of Police and then through the Minister of Police, on the local police to take very forceful action against workers uh, who are camped out on, on the mountain. And part of the argument is that we can't allow this protest to continue because it will encourage politicians who are in favour of nationalisation. So here we see a very close link between the police and their support for repression, their involvement in the repression at Maracana, 34 people killed that one day, and big capital. Now, is this an exception, do you think, Jane? Or is this part of the reason why there appears to be this increased level of securitization? What's the relationship, in other words, what's the relationship between uh, the state and capital? I spoke earlier about the budget speech. The implication of what is being said there by uh, the Minister of Finance is that there's a response by the government to increased levels of protest, increased levels of resistance, and that this then becomes the justification for increased levels of repression, of expenditure on the police. But it really means, in practice, repression. I mean, this money is not going to be spent on service delivery of the kind we normally think of. It's not you know, for more toilets or something for the police. It's not for uh, them to have nicer houses. But this is being presented in the media as service delivery. Increased budgets for service delivery. The main one is the police. That's where the biggest increase in service delivery is. This is service delivery, according to them. But what's this about? Is this then about a simple response to increased levels of protest, increased levels of ordinary people trying to exert their rights in order to get little bits of uh, electricity, water, the kind of thing that they've been denied over the past 20 years. The past 20 years have brought improvements to many people, but we know not only that inequality has increased, unemployment has increased, uh, the level of homelessness has increased, but also in recent years the level of poverty has, has increased. So to what extent is increased repression, increased securitization, a response to uh, movements from below. And if it is, are there countervailing pressures of some kind? Is there a point where, where the authorities, the government, the police say, mm -mm, I don't think we can do this. It's going to cause a reaction. I mean, for me, one of the most important things about Maracana is that despite 34 being, people being killed, the workers kept striking. They weren't intimidated. They continued. They encouraged workers elsewhere to go on strike. They did another strike in 2014. They weren't deterred by the fact that 34 of their members had been killed. And instead it reinforced, it reinforced their militancy. I went to meetings on a number of occasions and one of the arguments was we can't let our fallen comrades down. 35, 34 people died. We have to fight for them. So there can be instances where police repression forces a reaction and people fight even harder. So to what extent are we going to find a situation where despite increased repression, people continue to fight? That is, that what the police and the government are trying to do will be counterproductive. That increased expenditure on the police, rather than leading to more control by the state over society, in fact has the reverse effect that people are shot more often, they're repressed more often, and begin to fight back more effectively, develop new forms of organisation, uh, and so on. Um, Jane alluded 
to uh, divisions that somehow sometimes occur within the state. Differences between the police, the army, sometimes they shoot each other. Metro police shoot South African police in downtown Joburg. Now, I, I, would, I would be very grateful if we could hear uh, some explanation as to why that occurs. Is that to do with competition over turf? You know, we want to do the shooting rather than you doing the shooting. You know, what's it about? Why are there people, why are cops shooting cops? Why are people in the army shooting cops and so on? Why, why does that happen? What's that about? Um, and doesn't it suggest that rather than us just focusing on something we call securicrats, we need to some, think of something that's more complex? I mean, and, and I would be very grateful if we could have an explanation of, of who, the, who the securocracy are. Who are the securocrats? How many of them are there? How many of them are there? Five? Fifty? Five hundred? Five thousand? Fifty? I don't know how many of them there are. What does it really mean? What's the definition of a securicrat? That's, that's, that's what, I, what, what I'd like to hear, hear more about. Um, and then in terms of policing, to what extent are there now divisions, if you know, I mean these are difficult questions and, and perhaps are unfair questions, but to what extent are there now divisions opening up within the police about how to deal with the multiple problems of control and discipline that exist within society. Could there be an argument within the police that says rather than us putting more money into repression, we have to recognize that there are real problems facing ordinary people and these have to be dealt with in different kinds of ways. That there has to be a human rights approach to policing. That more resources need to go into the kind of delivery that municipalities should be doing and are not doing. So. Is there, is there an argument that might exist even within the, within the police for um, how one deals with these um, strategic uh, issues? So those are my questions. Um, but you know, finally, and again these things are unfair, I would hate to have these kind of questions myself, but um, what do we do about it? I mean, you know, it seems to me that Jane and I would both say, don't be frightened. You know, get on, do your thing. The worst thing is to be frightened about this kind of stuff. Um, it just encourages them. But beyond that, what, what do we do about it? How can we organise? How can we mobilise to, to stop what appears to be this increasing level of repression or securitisation? Are there any ideas that you've got about how to deal with that based upon your experience? The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.